Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to look at a lens from a company that I have never reviewed one of their lenses before. In fact, before I um, was told about this particular lens, I'd never even heard of the lens brand before, and that is a, another uh, Chinese startup lens maker by the name of Zonlai. Now, uh, Zonlai, I became aware of this actually through their current distributor, who is the same distributor that distributes the Sanesonic brand or Camland lenses, which I have um, reviewed one of those before, and, uh, and I'm working on another one right now. And so, um, anyway, they, so they told me about the lens, and, and so I got a copy to uh, take a look at and evaluate. So, today we're going to be taking a first look and also um, showing you uh, some of the images from the, the lens, and I'll follow that up with a more detailed image quality and final review on the lens. But let me just um, jump ahead to that to say, because I've been shooting for it, with it for uh, several weeks now, that um, this is a surprisingly competent little lens. Um, particularly when you consider the price point that it comes at, which is only around 150 bucks. And, and so in this case, this is a 22 millimeter f1.8 lens, and it's for APS-C mirrorless cameras um, like Sony E-mount, which I'm reviewing it on, on a Sony A6500 body. You can also get it on a Fuji X-mount, a Micro Four Thirds, and then an EOS M, Canon EOS M mount. And so, uh, you know, nice typical variety of mirrorless APS-C and then Micro Four Thirds sensors there. First thing I want to note before I look at the lens itself is that the uh, presentation for a budget lens like this is actually really, really good. Um, it comes in what is kind of similar to like a watch type box to where it, um, it's magnetic and it kind of folds out and you know, and then the lens is presented inside. It's, it's, it's actually surprisingly elegant for such a budget lens. And uh, in a separate compartment, it does come with a lens hood. I'm gonna just pause on that for a moment and just talk about the fact that you actually have two options for lens hoods. Now, the, it comes with kind of a uh, suction com, um, friction type cap that you can use if you're just using the bare lens itself. This is very reminiscent, if you're familiar at all, with uh, classic lenses like uh, Tacumar lenses. I've got a number of those in my you know kind of personal collection that have a very similar suction type friction cap. In this case, um, it fits really nicely um, and it fits fits you know, good and securely due to the fact that it is lined with some felt inside and uh, thus that helps to create a little bit more friction and so I've had zero issues with it falling off. It's also kind of a very clean finish that is a little bit more elegant than the other option of the pinch cap which I'm going to come back to in just a second. It does come with an included and this is actually a very lightweight like aluminum metal uh, lens hood. In this case, this is not a bayonet, bayonet mount where you just kind of click it into place, but rather it is a threaded screw on. And, and so kind of like if you, again, going back to the, the vintage lenses, if you ever used an M42 mount, uh, screw mount, um, you know, there'll be something like that, except for you're screwing on to the front. And in this case, while you um, obviously you are occupying the filter threads by screwing that on, but fortunately inside the lens hood itself, it is, um, again, it, it has a, another screw in filter portion. And so you can actually screw the filters into the lens hood itself. And so you don't sacrifice the filter threads by doing that. So uh, that's, you know, that's obviously a nice option there. The one thing that you do eliminate by putting on the lens hood is of course the, the suction friction cap no longer fits over the top. And so what's included is a generic, um, when I say generic, it's not branded in any way. The uh, this cap is nicely branded. It actually has kind of a cool aesthetic to it. and uh, But this is kind of a generic pinch cap. It is, as you can see, it has a string attached to it that you can, um, you know, so you're, if you're concerned with losing it, if, like me, you're going to consider that to be maybe... <laughs> something more of a pain than what it is an asset. Of course, you can always just cut that off and just use the pinch cap and store it in a pocket or whatever. But if you're a person who habitually loses lens caps, this may be a net positive for you. Now, the lens hood itself, um, as you can see, it creates um, you know a different type profile for the lens, which the lens itself profile is already kind of more of a rangefinder type design. So if you're familiar with lenses, maybe for Leica, uh, it looks, the aesthetic is more like those. And I find that kind of, in this case, maybe exaggerated a bit by the fact that the, the uh, distributor sent me 
a silver finish as opposed to a black finish. And I can't tell you whether I prefer one or the other. It's, it's, it makes it different. It kind of stands out from other lenses. And so whether that's a positive or a negative will depend on your taste, you know, for certain things. But I kind of like it. It's kind of cool. And so I'm enjoying that. So as I noted, it does change the profile. Now, if you can see that it's actually slotted um, here. And so that, of course, does give you an anchor point for tying that on. However, um, you know, in some situations, I don't find that this very shallow lens hood, it's about a half inch, you know, a little over a centimeter deep. And so as a byproduct of that, it means that if the sun's in the frame or, you know, a strong backlight is in the frame, it's not going to do a whole lot. But what it does do is that it does prevent, you know, side light. And I do have found that when a bright light source is kind of just out of the frame, there can be some veiling that's introduced to the lens. And so using the lens hood in that situation is going to be uh, beneficial. And the nature of this that it's of course because it's not a bayonet mount with bayonet mounts what you can do is you can reverse them for storage that's not an option here and so because it is a threaded lens hood it means that you're going to have to either store it and not have it along or you're going to have to you know basically keep it in that fixed position and use the uh, pinch cap to, um, to finish things off, off up front. So anyway, there you have two options for your lens hood and, or excuse me, lens cap, I should say. And, uh, you know, in terms of the aesthetic, I like this look better. I like the compact nature, but there's certainly always some value in the lens hood. I mean, one other thing to note on the lens hood is it does have a um, kind of a, it's a, it's not flocked inside. What it is, it is, it's very, very, very tiny machined ribs that are in there kind of designed for the same purpose. It actually looks from a, a close distance even. It looks like it's flocked, but it's actually ribbed. All of that is designed to prevent stray light from bouncing around. Now, in terms of the actual build here, what we are looking at is really, um, a, for such a cheap price, a surprisingly premium feeling lens. Uh, it's all metal and glass construction, kind of a, uh, it's, it's all a, like a aluminum that is a part of the, the build design. And so, uh, you know, it has some heft to it, but at the same time, it's not a heavy lens in an absolute sense in any sh shape of the word. It's, it's 224 grams and that's uh, about 7.9 ounces. And so obviously it mounts very nicely, like say onto the A6500 that I'm reviewing it on and feels like a, a perfect match there. Kind of looks cool mounted on the lens too, or the camera itself because the lens stands out and it just gives it kind of a different um, aesthetic there. And so um, build grade is very nice. I, there's a few things that almost strike me as being premium about this. Um, if you look at the front, number one, it has a really um, cool looking lens facade. And again, it's metal. And again, it's that very fine ribbing that, you know, there's some machining work done on that that makes, sets it apart from just kind of, you know, blah, ordinary looking. And uh, you can see that there are lens coatings that are attached. You can see that as the light is reflected off of them. And so in this case, uh, the fact that it's it's got the branding here at the front, it has kind of a classic effect aesthetic to it but it's a um, it's also kind of a premium looking aesthetic and I really like that I also noted that when I looked at the back the back has um, again it's a solid um, aluminum piece that is finely machined with ribbing that actually looks really quite cool and while there is no kind of weather sealing and by the way there's no electronics here which I'll double back to in a second so there's nothing like that back here, but when, um, and the, the rear element does move forward a little bit. There is a very, very slight about a half inch extension that takes place when you focus down towards minimum focus. And so there is, the, the negative is that there is a little bit of a gap into the exterior ex exposed, which is true of every lens that, um, you know, is rear focusing, which is the majority of them. But because I can see just a little bit inside, I can see just a tiny bit of the lens construction. And that again struck me, struck me as being premium because of the fact of a couple of things. Number one, the whole in, internal surround piece that I see is um, there's, there's two kind of half moon pieces that you can tell are just a solid piece of aluminum. Beyond that, there is also a, a brass section in between on each side to where I can see um, you know, a, a brass plate and I can see two actual 
physical screws there. And so instead of things being glued together or just shimmed together, this lens actually has some kind of premium design elements to it. And so my feeling coming away from it is actually quite a nice um, lens in terms of the, the build quality. And that's you know further reinforced by it is a manual aperture. So running from f1.8 to f16. And so um, all of the clicks feel good. There's one very, very minor issue there. Um, it's minor to me, it might not be to you, um, on this particular copy, which I suspect is lens specific. And that is that I kind of reach the end of the aperture ring right before f16 is fully engaged. And I have to kind of put a little extra pressure on there to hear a click, and I'm not sure that that detent holds because the um, aperture ring isn't exactly lined up there perfectly. It's fine on the other end and through f1.8, but, um, and so there's definite clicks between f1.8 and f2. After that, there are full stops, f2.8, f4, f5.6, etc. Now, in terms of the manual focus ring, it is pretty much perfect. Um, perfectly damped, it's got a lot of focus throw, but not too much to where you're kind of like, you know, focus, 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 trying to get in place. I, I find it, you know, it's pretty much perfect there. And so I'm uh, very, very happy with that. Um, it's about mm, 220 degrees of focus um, travel. And so I, again, I think that's just about right. Um, it does also have hyperfocal markings for you know, a useful amount, everything from 1.8, it has f5.6, f8, f11, f16. What often happens with a lot of lenses that I've seen that do have hyperfocal markings is that they have hyperfocal markings for, you know, maximum aperture and then minimum aperture and often almost nothing in between. Whereas I rarely will shoot lenses above f8 if not necessary because um, with, with higher resolution cameras, which all of my cameras that I own now are, you end up having some issues with diffraction starting to set in and a little bit of image softness starts to creep in due to diffraction. And so I mean, having hyperfocal markings for both f5.6 and f8 are extremely useful to me. And, and so I'm finding that, you know, between that and all the manual focus aids that are built into, you know, Sony camera bodies, and not just Sony, but most of them now have a lot of uh, mirrorless cameras, have very good manual focus aids. Byproduct of that is that it's really not all that hard to focus this lens, and I've had pretty good focus accuracy out of it as a result. Now, of course, this is a 22 millimeter f1.8 lens. And so that means that it has a field of view on a Sony APS-C, that's 1.5 times crop factor, same for Fuji, is that it has a field of view equivalent of 33 millimeters on, on a full frame system. And so basically what this is giving you is if you're you know familiar with full frame, it's giving you pretty close to a classic 35 millimeter focal length, just a little bit wider. It's a useful focal length for a lot of applications. Um, good for street, good, you know, wide enough to do some landscape work with it. Um, it's not so wide that you introduce a lot of extra distortion. And, and so uh, there's some certainly some pluses there. And, and so the focal length I find to be a useful one. You have a 46 millimeter filter thread, and that's whether you use the, you know, the filter threads right here or the filter threads within the lens hood itself. Another nice um, benefit to this lens, positive here, is that it can actually focus down really close, uh, down to 0 0.15 meters, 15 centimeters, and that is about uh, right on a half foot. And of course, that is from the camera body, you know, about midpoint in the camera body where the actual sensor is. And so you can focus down quite closely. And the byproduct of that is that you can, you have a 0 0.22 times magnification, which is very, very useful. And it also means that even with a, you know, a lens as wide as this, you can actually throw backgrounds quite out of focus um, if you're very close to your subject. That's a one to 4.6 times a reproduction ratio. Now internally, we're looking at eight elements in seven groups, and um, one of those is a low dispersion element. And uh, I will note, although I'm not looking at image quality so much in this episode, that the lens actually does a pretty surprisingly good job in controlling chromatic aberrations. 
not always a strength for you know budget prime lenses like this with wide apertures. And so definitely a very strong plus there. And so I'll give it praise on that note. And uh, the lens itself is, it's 55 millimeters long. It is 45 millimeters in diameter. As you can see, it's a very compact little optic there. And, and so, um, you know, again, uh, pluses there in terms of the build and the design of the lens itself. Now I noted before, there are no electronics um, that, that means a couple of things. Number one, it means that you're not going to have any built-in um, profiles to correct for vignette or distortion um, inside the camera body itself. It also means that when you come into post-processing, um, you're not going to automatically locate any kind of profile for it there. I have built a, um, a profile that I'll, um, I'll reveal the details of in uh, the image quality segment that helps to correct for the distortion and the vignette. And so I'll detail that when we look at image quality. Uh, it's, it's, there's nothing too extreme here and so it's not too hard. And the fact that it, it natively has a low chromatic aberration means that that's not really an um, issue to deal with as well. But another thing that I, I really do miss is that because there is no electronics, there is no EXIF data that is communicated that's lens specific. And so you're not going to have this lens identified in your software. Um, it's not going to tell you focal length or the lens itself. And also a bit of a challenge is, is that it's not going to communicate aperture value. Which means when I talk about correcting for something like vignette, for example, you know, your correction level for vignette at f1.8 is not going to be the appropriate level of correction for f2.8 or f4. And, and so if you just kind of build one standard profile, if the software has no way of knowing what aperture value is actually used, the, um, you know, the, the profile can be over the top. And so that's just something to, uh, to note for. And it's the reality of all these type lenses that don't communicate electronically uh, with the camera body itself. And so, um, as I noted, all of this at a price of $150, we're going to delve into the optics in the next episode and the review, but um, I, I'll just tell you this. I was very pleasantly surprised by what I discovered on most levels when it comes to the optical performance. And so, uh, stay tuned with me and we'll detail that um, in the next episode. In the meantime, you can check out an image gallery that I've got going, and I was able to take this lens along on a recent trip to um, Virginia and um, there in the Shenandoah area, and then also um, I went into Washington, D.C. and uh, shot with uh, it some there. And so anyway, I've got a, a, a nice variety of images from it that I, I really like. I think that you'll like as well. And so I encourage you to take a look at those. There's going to be some buying links there if you would like to source one for yourself. And of course, if you haven't already, you can follow me on social media. It's down in the description. Sign up for my newsletter. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.